All right, everybody, we're going to uh, get started here. Thank you for uh, all coming out and braving the cold. No snow in January, so that's a good thing. So uh, thank you all for coming out. We're really excited to host this event uh, for the region today. I think it's going to be a fantastic discussion, really interesting topic. Um, we're excited to kick off this new uh, event series of ours, the CEO Talks, to, to complement the, the, the general networking uh, events that we do each and every month. Uh, of course, our mission is to build a more connected workforce in the region. Um, and, and that workforce is uh, everything from CEOs and entrepreneurs down to, down to the bench. And um, uh, there couldn't be a better place for us to kick this uh, event series off. Uh, and we've done a couple events here at Montgomery College and uh, uh, our sponsor, PICMC, the Life Science Innovation Center here at the college. They host uh, startups and businesses. So this is a community college um, with an incubator uh, accelerator right here on campus. So uh, it's a pretty unique uh, community college, the only community college in the whole country that has a health system right here on campus. So you have a community college where we're teaching the next generation. You have a health system right here. We also have world-class laboratories right here on campus. And it's amazing. I mean, it's pharmaceutical grade laboratories. Uh, one of our sponsors, Biotrack, um, is here today. Uh, right now they have a epigenetics workshop where they have scientists from all around the world who are traveling here into Maryland to Montgomery College for these courses. Um, in fact, last week they had a gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9 course as well where they had 20 scientists from around the world. So when you put all these factors together, I mean, that's a pretty amazing story, and it's a pretty amazing that this is all in one campus right, right here in Maryland. Um, so and I, what's great also is it's a good representation of what Maryland and the biohealth capital region has. That type of activity is happening across the state, across the region. And we have 70 federal labs, we have the best universities, we have a very vibrant biotech ecosystem. So that example of what's happening right here on campus is happening all across the region. So um, what we want to do, and, and what well, we're so happy to have uh, uh, WSGR here as a sponsor, what we want to do is just continue that conversation and make sure everyone knows about that and provide opportunities for you all to get together around topics, create those collisions to make more things happen and, and, and bring more products to market. So um, we're excited to be here. There's a lot of organizations that are involved in, in getting this uh, event together. Uh, WSGR is our, our lead sponsor, as well as PICMC, uh, BioBuzz, and, and Biotrax. We thank them and, uh, for all their efforts to do so. And there's a lot of organizations involved in this biotech ecosystem. Uh, BioHealth Innovation, you know, Rich is here from that. Um, uh, TEDCO, uh, the Maryland Tech Council. Um, so it's a really a collaborative effort. And when you look at our region compared to others, you know, we may not have a lot of the same amount of density, but we can out collaborate. And I think that's a really good mission for us because we're gonna out collaborate them. Um, so, and that's what we're starting to do here today. So with that, um, I'm uh, happy to introduce our moderator today, um, the very wise uh, Charles Andrus from uh, WSGR. Uh, so uh, Charlie has an extremely uh, impressive track record. He's got over 70 publications, uh, four drug approvals, and um, but practices not only FDA law, but patent law. So he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to this topic, and um, you know, it was really going to lead a really fantastic panel with our panelists today. So I'm going to stop talking and, and give the mic up to you for, uh, for the uh, majority of our program. So thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Chris, um, for you know, selecting this just incredible venue and for all your hard work and you know, the logistics for putting all this together. Um, and I, I appreciate the intro because it creates no pressure, so that's good for me. Um, and we're very lucky, I think, to have three entrepreneurs with us today who have companies that will hopefully go on to change the world. Um, they are dealing in whole or in part in the immuno-oncology space. This is, I think, in my opinion, sort of one of the three future areas of, of medicine that are going to have significant impact, the other being, the other two being regenerative medicine and epigenetics. Um, they each have, uh, their companies are each taking a different approach, which is interesting. 
Uh, they're represented geographically in different places. For example, Paul and his company are located uh, on the West Coast. And um, they also have different levels of entrepreneurial experience. Um, so uh, Jeff, for example, is a seasoned entrepreneur, uh, whereas Paul is a little bit earlier and still kind of earning his stripes. Nice way to call me old. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I saw that. <laughs> I, I got more gray hair. <laughs> so I, I think it would be appropriate uh, before we get into the, the questions, um, maybe if each of you could introduce yourselves and maybe tell the audience a little bit about, about your companies. Okay. okay. I'll Bill, go first. you're up first. So I'm Bill Hurl. I'm the CEO of Immunomic Therapeutics. Uh, Immunomic Therapeutics is about 10 years old. Uh, we were founded on a technology out of Johns Hopkins, and we took a, a different route to, to immuno-oncology than a lot of people might have suspected. We, we started out actually uh, in the allergy area, and we picked allergy as sort of a low-cost low option for us to prove that our technology works uh, with the idea that we would come back to immuno-oncology once we were successful with the allergy proof of concept. And uh, very rarely do you actually have a business plan that actually does what you thought it was going to do. But in this particular case, everything kind of played, played out perfectly. And we ended up with a very large deal with Estella's Pharma that took the whole allergy business and left us with a nice little nest egg to come back and work in immuno-oncology. So uh, our relationship with academic collaborators allowed us to really jump right into a, a program for glioblastoma which is now in phase two at uh, University of Florida and at Duke. And so it's a very promising uh, uh, cell therapy for glioblastoma, and it's uh, uh, something I'm very excited about. So uh, we, like I said, we took a different route than a lot of people. We've never had, a, we've never had any VC funding. And so if you can imagine a 10-year-old biotech company that actually turned a profit with no VC funding, that's a little bit different than, than many. And so it's a different strategy. So it's. Uh, uh, been an interesting ride. I have many curious and fascinating stories to tell, I'm sure. It's, so, maybe we'll take some time so to talk about that. Bill, maybe we could just clarify that because I think that was a bit of an understatement. You said you had a little nest egg. Could you maybe tell the audience just how little that nest egg is? Well, it, yeah, that was, uh, we did a, a $300 million deal with Estella. So that was $300 million of cash. That was not bio bucks. That was real money. And so I have to tell you that one of the best days of my life was when my CFO came in and said, hey, look at the Bank of America balance. And this, the number on the back screen was like this. And I was like, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, for those of you who want to put aside a little nest egg, uh, you have something to shoot for. Um, thank you, Bill. Uh, you know, Jeff, maybe you could go next. Sure. Hard to follow that one. We don't, we don't have a nest egg, but that sounds like an inspirational story. I'm going to keep that in mind. <laughs> Put that in the business plan. So um, our company, so I'm Jeff Galvin, uh, CEO of American Gene Technologies, and our company is also 10 years old. Started when I met a guy at uh, National Institutes of Health who showed me viral vectors. I come out of the computer space and looking at viral vectors and knowing what I knew about the technology and how microcomputers revolutionized the whole market and. Uh, you know, and looking at the cell now as an organic computer and our ability to actually change things in it to mitigate disease, my head practically exploded. I, I just said to him, somebody's got to be the Microsoft of this business. Might as well be us. And he didn't know what I was talking about, but that was really my vision for the company. It was that delivering the goods was going to be a critical component in every application that eventually gets written for the human computer and that if you focused on a platform of tools and enabling technologies that allowed you to make these applications more quickly than anybody else, then you'd be a go-to collaborator in this space over the long term. In other words, build it and they will come. Well, that's turned out to be uh, true. So, uh, of course, nobody buys platforms, they buy products. That's just a common wisdom in the industry. So at some point when I started to sense that the financial markets were ready for this, we decided, okay, let's take our lead uh, developments and propel them into the clinic. And uh, we also have no VC funding. 
Uh, all of our money came from high net worth individuals, some angel funds, uh, and some boutique investment uh, companies. And um, we uh, were able to find a fairly inexpensive way to get our HIV functional cure into phase one trials. We expect that to happen this summer. And we believe we have a functional cure uh, for HIV, that we can restore natural immunity to HIV by doing something that looks a lot like CAR-T. We pull out T cells, modify them, put them back in. We restore your ability to fight off HIV instead of being, uh, having your HIV specific T cells depleted or co-opted by the disease. Instead, you fight it like you fight the flu and the cold and once you have memory effect of those T cells, you're immune for life. You'll mop up your own viral reservoir and you won't have to take uh, antiretroviral therapy and, and I gotta say that everything I'm seeing in the preclinical data at this point is, uh, is confidence building and uh, I'm not a molecular biologist. Like I said, I came from the computer space, but when we show this to people that really know HIV, uh, you can see it, uh, you know, the excitement and, and sort of the belief that they have in this as well. So, but that's just the start. I mean, it, the idea is prove the technology and then create a machine that turns out um, these um, drug apps uh, that are de-risked for pharma. We, you know, we feel like we can hit a good inflection point. That's why I was like, inspirational story, right? If we can go ahead and do something that's really good for Roche or Pfizer or Gilead, I mean, you can imagine that HIV cure would be of interest to Gilead. Uh, you know, we could go ahead and bank some cash that we can use to just drive this machine that's really my dream, which is to action gene and cell therapy for the broad audience, for the, for the public as quickly as possible. So we have phenylketonuria right on the tail, that's a monogenic disease. And then we have immuno-oncology where we have a, a vector that stimulates the primary tumor uh, in any epithelial cancer, causes the gamma delta T cells to activate and start eating at 300 to 600 times their normal level in the microenvironment. We're getting 75 to 85 percent complete remission in mouse models and abscopal effect. So these circulating gamma delta T cells, once they're excited, they tend to clean up the rest of the epithelial cancers in the mouse. It doesn't even have to match the primary tumor because gamma delta cells, and you're gonna hear a lot about gamma delta T cells over this next year, they exquisitely select for their targets. They've never been associated with an autoimmune disease. They're really good at eating cancers. The trick is, is how do you get them looking at the cancers? It could be, you know, remove a checkpoint molecule. It could be, you know, uh, doing something to the gamma delta T cells. We're seeing that actually Bluebird is planning to put cars on gamma delta T cells. Our philosophy is treat the cancer, not the immune system. Immune system's complicated. If you can leave it in its natural state, that's the safest way to go. And we think we have an approach where uh, one vector to the uh, primary tumor uh, could even work in a late stage cancer and we're starting to gather a lot of data that that should be the case. That'll be a 2020 uh, clinical trial for us, we believe. Thank you. Thanks. So, Sorry for going so long. No, sure. it's okay. I think you brought up an interesting point though, right? So initially, you know, it kind of sounds like you're moving along something that seems to be an emerging paradigm, which is initially you're just looking for something that provides some kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is eventually to take a disease which can be terminal and convert it to something that you can treat chronically. And then, you know, the next step in that is actually to quote unquote cure the disease. And it seems like you're kind of moving along that pathway, maybe with the goal of, of transitioning from chronic treatment to an actual cure. Yeah, I, I, I see how you, how you that that could be a takeaway. So let me tell you how, what my thinking really is, right? So I come out of software. And you know, what's my whole life in software has always been the same. It's you have this limited tool set and you're trying to create value. That's it. And so it doesn't matter what the low hanging fruit is. Mm -hmm. You can't survive as a software company unless you can figure out how to creatively combine things that already exist, whether you develop them or somebody else, and come up with something that has some value to the customer. Right, so um, customers are complex in the healthcare industry, but basically we just focus on the patient. 
If we have something that solves a patient problem, we think that that will eventually find its way out to those patients. So uh, remarkably, a complex disease like HIV became the low-hanging fruit, and a lot of it was just serendipity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that the right team gelled around it at the right time and just coincidental things that I thought of in, you know, while taking a shower to seem to get some traction with people that actually knew HIV. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about the tool set and all of a sudden something's there that we could action. But we don't care what it is. We don't care whether it's a treatment, a cure, a knock, you know, something that will knock back a disease for a period of time and we can start to treat, treat it chronically. Mm -hmm. um, we just think, how can we move the needle in efficacy in healthcare? That's the critical thing that we, we're just keeping an eye on. And there, this, I was just saying this to Paul earlier, I haven't met a company in this business yet that I didn't think had tremendous potential <laughs> because it's so big. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 6,000 monogenic diseases that are completely untreatable right now, but the palliative care is two to, to four trillion dollars a year in the healthcare system. How would you like to move that to pharmaceuticals? Well, right? You Here you go, it. this panel's doing it, right? And that is the potential. It's not, you know, there'll be more than, he's got, you know, several $300 million payouts in his future, I guarantee it. Hopefully all of us on this uh, panel have that. That is the land grab that is gene and cell therapy today. And I, I think it's a good point, right? Before I uh, you know, took on my second career as a, a lawyer, I spent 10 years at uh, working at a no-name pharmaceutical company called Bristol Myers Squibb. And um, at the time, the model that Bristol operated on was blockbuster. Everything had to be a blockbuster drug. And you know, in 2020, Bristol Myers Squibb is slated to become the number one orphan drug seller in the US. And so people are looking at things like the Orphan Drug Act. They're looking at you know, these unmet diseases. You, you mentioned 6,000. I think the number in some estimates is closer to eight or nine. And each one of those represents an opportunity because many of them have you know, only sort of palliative type treatment, as you were pointing out. So thank you. Sure. Paul. So uh, my name is Paul Tume. I'm uh, the, one, a, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Biograph 55. We're um, a little less than two years old. Uh, the two other co-founders are Tony Rebos from UCLA Medical Center and Peter Thompson from Orbamed. And we founded Biograph 55 to help solve some of the biggest challenges in immuno-oncology today. And that's that despite clinical success, most patients do not respond to single agent checkpoint inhibitors. And so we developed a technology platform at UCLA. We hand carried that technology platform over to the biotech side. And it's a target discovery um, technology platform. And so um, with that, we've identified targets that we believe are differentiated. And our therapeutic strategy is focused on not converting tumors from T-cell non-inflamed to T-cell inflamed. Our therapeutic strategy is to uh, convert T-cell inflamed tumors that are resistant to T-cell inflamed and responsive. Because from the, the work we've done, we believe that T-cell inflammation is uh, required but insufficient to achieve a clinical response. And um, so we are currently in our seed stage of financing. The last two years, actually, we very quickly built out the platform. It's been validated on a technical and clinical level with um, over 10 different you know, partners, um, five of which are coming back. And <clears throat> during that time, we, we made you know, these internal discoveries that have uh, led to us evolving from sponsored research towards um, to, to developing drugs. And so the goal is to, we're about to close our seed stage financing and we anticipate that we would raise and close our Series A sometime towards the end of 2018. Thank you. So that raises a couple of, of questions in my mind. Um, you know, the first is, um, you're talking about 
I think really the cancer environment itself. And people will generally say that cancer is sort of a random thing. It happens to you because you were out in the sun for too long or you pumped too much gas or you ate too many uh, foods with like weird additives that haven't been in nature before. You know, what are your thoughts on cancer and randomness? I, I don't think that there is anything random about cancer. Um, in fact, with the, you know, my, my focus is mel the melanoma tumor microenvironment. It has grown to multiple solid tumor types, but I think it's, what Charlie's raising is a very important point, that cancers are not a randomly built set of networks. And we know very little about how these cells within the tumor communicate with each other to promote their survival. And what we're finding is that there are very, uh, rec there are very, there are patterns that are conserved in subgroups of tumors. And so if there is a pattern, by definition it is regular, which means that there is an underlying mathematical structure to that pattern. So what we've done is we've applied graph theory to understanding how are cells talking to each other? Where are they? What are the underlying cellular networks that lead to emerging properties for these cancers to be able to grow in the, in, in the host? Because we, we've been designed you know, to, work, to kill cancer, right? So in order for a cancer to become metastatic and be able to live in a host and a patient, it must have acquired so many capabilities, right? And in order to do that, it's got to communicate with host cells. So what we're finding is that that pathologic communication is actually very conserved. It's an important point because if you want to select the right patients um, for a particular treatment, right, we are, you know, the clinic is in urgent need of combinations that work, right? And we need to know which patients are most likely to benefit. Well, how can you do that if you don't share any genomic overlap, meaning if one patient has a particular mutation landscape, right, and another patient has a completely different one, well, how do you select those patients for the same treatment, right? If you, if you go up one level of biological organization to the cellular networks, we're actually finding that patients that have a particular cell-to-cell -cell communication sitting in one particular location of the tumor are much more likely to respond to treatment, to say single-agent NIPD1, than others. So, so our view of cancer is that it's no different than your normal organs, except it's got cellular networks that are pathologic. Okay. So, you know, you sort of also, I think, hinted, and I'm going to throw this out to, to Bill, um, at, you know, in some cases you get funding through, um, you know, friends and family, maybe angels, maybe VCs, maybe venture arms of pharmaceutical companies. Um, and, and after Bill handles this, I'd like to get, you know, your thoughts as well, uh, Jeff and Paul. Um, sort of how difficult is it to get funding in the current environment? And does the nature of the funding that you get shape the way that your company evolves? Okay. Complicated question. But um, for, for immunomic therapeutics, when I first started going out to raise money, uh, I, I was going and I thought we had a, a strong pitch. The technology was invented by uh, somebody that truly had deserved a Nobel Prize in immunology, Tom August. It was uh, a very sound and unique approach to, to, to uh, attacking problems in the immune system, and yet we weren't getting anywhere. And I remember when my colleague came into my office and she said, well, you know, vical has been around for 20 years and they've raised a lot of money. And so I said, hmm, they've raised a lot of money and they haven't done anything, and so maybe there's kind of the crux of the problem is that we were trying to raise money in a field that had been we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so we, what we had to do is evolve our thinking and our story 
so that we were emphasizing the strengths of the technology, not kind of go, falling back on standardized buzz, buzzwords around what the technology was. So a, a DNA vaccine at the time, 10 years ago, was very, very unpopular. And so it, it created a problem for us in how we presented the company. And even if you look at uh, probably the most successful company publicly that's out there right now, Anovio doesn't even ever talk about being a DNA vaccine. They, they came up with another name to describe their technology. So they, they worked around what was a resistance. So I, I think the issue for a company is we're going out of raising money where I think there's, uh, there's plenty of money. You just have to make the right story and make a compelling case that, that if somebody gives you $20 million, you have a reasonable chance of turning that into 50, 60, or $80 million over the amount of time, time before that money's gone. And so everybody, you need to look, kind of look at the money in terms of, of blocks of time and turning that money into value. And so you have to have a concrete plan to take money that's coming in and convert it into value. And I think that as long, that's, that's the, I know, the number one thing aside from the person that's sitting across the table because if your management team has no credibility, you're not getting dime one. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's just table stakes, but a lot of times we forget that the person, the reason the person is writing a check is because they like you. Uh, I did an event at Fisher Island, and I was, the last per I was the last person, I was speaking after lunch, and I had like the worst time slot, and I was thinking, this is uh, not going to go well. And so I ate lunch, and I was sitting there having lunch, and I just sat down, and this gentleman came over, and he sat next to me, and we just talked about this and that and golf and what have you. And I said, he said, are you speaking? I said, yeah, I'm next. And he says, oh, he says, you seem very interesting. I'm going to listen. And so when I finished, he came up to me and he says, I'm going to invest in your company. And he didn't say very much. He just he gave me his card and information. He left. And the guy that was the host says, you know, that's the richest guy on Fisher Island. And I, I said, get out of here. <laughs> and it was just like a regular guy. And sometimes you just, you just have to kind of be yourself and it, it Things kind of fall your way, and it's just who, who, who knows that that's going to happen. The, uh, the other part to the story, and the second part of your question, is that when you're looking at raising money, you have to recognize that the kind of investors you bring in are going to have a big impact in how your company develops. Well, one of the reasons I didn't really want to pursue VC funding is because I did not believe a single VC would stand behind the allergy story. I thought that they would look at, at what we had, look at the early immuno-oncology data and say, you should be doing this. And we're going to put all your money in and we're going to do this immuno-oncology thing. And that's where we think the big cash out is. And they would have just put the allergy story to bed. But I, I was absolutely convinced that we had something very unique in allergy and I didn't want to give that up. And so that was a trade that I was willing to make in terms of gray hair and sleepless nights and what have you, and pushing for the allergy story and keeping control of the business, but raising money in smaller blocks, as opposed to taking the larger block and having a couple other people sitting around the board table that were going to push the company in a direction that I didn't think was the best for ITI. And so it kind of turned out okay. And so now we're looking at, now we're ready for a different phase. Uh, last year I was at the uh, JP Morgan Founders Forum, which they have in the spring, and uh, the speaker from uh, Berkshire Hathaway said they watch companies and the companies get up and they reach a, have success and then they reach a plateau and they watch them at this plateau stage and he says not that many companies have the wherewithal to make the leap again and get to the next level and so I thought about that and I was like you know we just can't sit here at this plateau we have to drive now to make this next leap and so that's our next challenge and that's kind of how we're looking at raising our next round of funds. Thank you. Um, Jeff, Paul, any thoughts on funding or partnering, especially you know, not just in the important topics that Bill was discussing, but also maybe a sort of a, a form of validation, for example? Well, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, since this is a short thing, I'll, I'll be provocative, I'd say, Raising money in this market is exceedingly easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, the second half of the question is really the key. What does it do to your company? 
So uh, I think Bill alluded to this, is you've got a great management team and a decent idea, you're gonna get money. There's money to be made. At this point, Wall Street is like, yeah, the, uh, you know, all the IPOs for the next couple of years and all our commissions are gonna be in this space. So, you know, all you have to do is have cred in that space and some VC will come along and give you $50 million and you can go ahead and start the company. And, but just remember, the agenda will be return on that money within the period of time which is correct for the VC model. Now, does that yield the best science? I don't think so. I think Bill would agree with me that, <laughs> you know, basically you have something that has potential and you have passion to go ahead and access that potential and to bring that potential to your audience, well, you have to think about who you engage in that mission. So I also, like Bill, feel that, you know, uh, if, I, if I track back in terms of my fundraising success, which has all been high net worth individuals, uh, and part of that is because I don't have cred in biotech, I come from the computer space. You know, I might have found some VC that had funded one of my successful startups back in Silicon Valley, and I might have been able to, you know, attract them into putting in some bucks into this. But, you know, I was embarking on something that I thought was totally new, non-traditional, was going to be that we were going to rewrite all the rules in this space. Just like, you know, when I was at Apple Computer, we were rewriting all the rules of microcomputers and computers in general. Who would have thought what, you know, a toy like the Apple II would have toppled Burroughs and Prime and GE and all the you know, mainframe manufacturers? I feel like who would have thought that the people at this table might top, topple the Roches, the Pfizer's, the Merck's? You know, how much room is there going to be for companies that can't change their business model and really action the most powerful technology that's on the horizon today? And, and so, uh, you know, my history of raising money is just being friendly. You know, we got a bunch of money in Newport Beach because I was talking to some cab driver and he was like, oh my gosh, this is really exciting. I know a lot of people with money. Can I raise money for you? I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay, here's my card. And, you know, a couple of million dollars came out of Newport Beach as a result. And then that just mushroomed and mushroomed and mushroomed. And, you know, I was friendly because I was telling my story everywhere. What did I have? I had nothing, nothing but a vision, all right? A vision that 10 years ago sounded crazy in the trough of exuberance for viral vectors. Everybody was like, yeah, viral vectors. You better not say your gene therapy because that's already failed. Call yourself cell therapy. That's the new marketing term. So, you know, I mean, this is just all the common for wisdom. Those of you who are sticking around, Jeff will be giving dance lessons after <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the, uh, I looked at this stuff and I think, oh yeah, I was lucky I was a little bit naive when I came into this thing because some people might have been, you know, they look at this leap of faith as being somewhat courageous, but even in retrospect, I go, it's not really that courageous. What super powerful technology hasn't failed in its first shot, right? I can't think of one. I mean, I just likened all these accidents in gene and cell therapy to, you know, being like uh, Madame Curie walking in with a radioactive rock and killing a bunch of grad students and herself. And it's like, oh, <laughs> radioactivity and radiate, that's the end of that. No, it's now the number one way we treat cancer, which is kind of crazy. I hope to send that the way of leeches and bloodletting soon. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact is, is that powerful technologies are met with over-exuberance, you know, because there is an excitement level that comes from a gut instinct that this thing's gonna be big, right? That ends up causing this, you know, curve that any consulting company will tell you about. And we were at the absolute trough in viral vectors because there had been two high profile deaths. But to me, it was like, no, this is the best time to start this business. Guess what there is out there right now? a huge number of unemployed molecular biologists that have enormous value and great ideas that are the future of all this stuff and let's go for it. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the short answer to the question is that, yeah, money's available, but every money comes with strings. And in my case, you know, it turned out that I was good at attracting people to my core vision. My core vision turned out to be correct. Now everybody believes what I believed 10 years ago. This is no longer, you know, like a, um, a, a weird point of view. It's the mainstream. And, um, but certain people just caught fire, 
right? And we were able to harness their passion, whether it was that, you know, go ahead and try this out in your lab. And, and we ended up engaging like a really great collaborator. Or it was a wealthy person who, who even said to me like, yeah, I might lose all my money, but it's still the right thing to do. How often do you hear that from a VC, right? No, these are the... No. You haven't? No. Even at Wilson Sonsini? Oh, um, come on. No. Yeah. Yeah. no, I mean, the thing is, is like, you've got to recognize the reality of the environment that you're going out into and that every single person has their agenda. And if you can meet the people that have your agenda, and if there's enough of them around, and you can, you can attract them around a core direction, a core mission, a core um, vision for the future, and they can propel that vision, well, to me, that's what it means to be a CEO. It's just getting people to work together, a whole diverse ecosystem now, from the lawyers to the doctors to the researchers to the high net worth individuals to the whatever, that just are attracted to your vision to the, of the future uh, and, the, and the hope that that brings and, and the power that you know hits us emotionally that, yeah, this could... This could be true. And my experience teaching computer science at Harvard to non-computer science people turned out to be one of the key components of my success in raising money, and that is that I could bridge complex technologies to the layman, and I could get them to see the value of exploring it further, and I could make them feel like they understood it, and then they could emotionally engage with it, and that brought the kind of money that didn't handcuff me or hobble me in terms of my scientific mission, and I can still turn to my CSO and I can say, hey, you're at a rare company where the science drives the, drives the whole uh, strategy here. We just, he'll come to me and this gamma delta T cell thing that, that he came up with, I was like, uh, in coming up, I'm going too long, but he, I was just like, oh, that's frickin' brilliant. I'm not a molecular biologist, but I'm like, that hits all my buttons in terms of that this thing, you know, is going to work. And it, it wasn't outside of our mission. I was just like, call the patent attorney. Let's get this thing, let's get the provisional in on this, because I don't want you doing a lot of work on this thing without a priority date. <laughs> and so, and he was resistant to that, but it turned out to be prescient. But he can do that anytime he wants. He can just walk into my office, and if he's got a brilliant idea, I'll just try to find money for it. And science drives us. Right. Yeah. Off. yeah. Um, but I think you, know, you raised a couple of points um, that are interesting, and I want to throw this next to Paul. So one of them was kind of like a stock market model, right? When everybody else is buying stocks, you don't want to be buying them. When people are running away from stocks, according to Warren Buffett, that's when you want to be getting in, um, which is an interesting point. I think the second is, especially with pitching, right? You never know what pitch is going to result in funding and the ability to take your technology and simplify it so that whoever's sitting across the table from you can understand it and feel your enthusiasm for it is a very important thing. Um, you raised a couple of other points though that I think are interesting in the, in the space of entrepreneurship, right? One of them is how do you deal with failure as an entrepreneur? Another is how do you deal with fear as an entrepreneur? And I think a third um, to go along with failure and fear is um, you know, what sort of qualities make for a successful entrepreneur? And Paul, maybe you could pick any one of those. Um, okay, how about, well, how about fear? Um, so, so I think to wrap that into what Bill and Jeff have been talking about um, and the concept of raising money, uh, you know, I think that the landing a size of, landing any investment, you know, or, or closing, um, the size of the investment should follow the magnitude of the innovation, and in order to have that kind of vision that, 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 that uh, Jeff's talking about, and to pursue it requires um, serious kind of built-in mechanisms to overcome fear. Um, I draw, you know, I left my academic career and my trajectory, which was, um, you know, I'd, I'd say promising, um, 
to pursue this because I didn't want to be, at the time I'm nearing the end of life, to regret that I didn't pursue it, if that makes sense. So, so the, the, the fear, um, I've spent enough time with people who are nearing the end of life, unfortunately, um, due to not having the right cancer treatments for them, to really appreciate that um, if it, regrets come up all the time at that stage, and I didn't want to look back and, and regret not pursuing something that we thought was highly innovative. Um, does that kind of touch upon your, or answer your, your, your question about the, if I chose one? I, I think it does. Um, you know, so one of the things is that impels you, kind of what you're saying is you got one shot, and if there's something you really feel like you should be doing, but there's a high associated risk, and I think you were being a little uh, self-effacing, right? You were a Howard Hughes medical investigator. You had a phenomenal academic career. But, but it's really important kind of to look at yourself and maybe say, I should go for this if it's something I really think I should do because if you don't do it and you miss that opportunity, there can be a lot of downstream regrets. Um, Bill, we talked a little bit about this and you had another take on, on entrepreneurship and that had to do, I think, with learning and thick skin. <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share this most embarrassing story. Uh, first, my first, my previous company, which was the first company I founded, I was, I was uh, uh, head of R and D at a small kind of mom and pop operation in Gaithersburg, and we put together some really interesting technologies, and all the exciting technology kind of scared pop. So he came into my office one day and he said, "I want you to get rid of all this," and I said, "Well, I'm not doing that." And so they had a board meeting and they called me in and said, well, Bill, we put all this stuff together, our new company, Fly Be Free, we'll fund you for a year. And so I had been successful as a scientist, but I had never been a CEO. And so the, the right answer to that situation was, what's my severance package? The wrong answer, which is the one that I gave, was woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first thing I did, of course, was, like anybody would normally do, is I put together a, a business plan and a, a presentation around the technologies that we had. And I went and presented it at the Dingman Center. And I, I never walked out of a meeting feeling worse than I did after that. It was like the guy said, oh, this is the worst document I've ever seen in my life. It's poorly written. It doesn't say anything. It's terrible. And I, I'm thinking, I, was like, I got lots of publications. How could I write such a terrible business plan that I would get treated like that? So I was really feeling bad about it. One of the guys there said, kind of maybe felt bad for me. He says, oh, he says, I have some friends out in San Francisco at uh, 10X Angels. Why don't you call him? So I call the guy up, and I'll talk to him, tell him what we're trying to do. And he says, what's your business model? And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, when you know, call me back. <laughs> <laughs> and so I called a friend. I said, I said well, what was he asking for? He says, he wants to know how you make money. And I said, well, why didn't he say so? I could tell him I was going to make money. Yeah, he says, but that's, you know, that's where you're at. So I, I, I realized at that point in time that I knew absolutely nothing about being an entrepreneur and, and uh, being a CEO, and I had a long way to go. So I really just had become a sponge. And the, uh, there was no room for, for being, having uh, this idea like, hey, I know, already, I know all this and I know what I'm doing. I realized pretty quickly uh, this was a completely different world than anything I'd ever dealt with before and I better toughen up and dig in or I'm, I'm gonna fail. And uh, the one thing I want, I just wanna say a comment about the fear thing, because I've told this story to some people and you've heard me say this before, but for the other people you guys have never heard this, I'll tell you what fear was for me. This was November 2009, it was a week before Thanksgiving and I called my guy up that was my fundraiser and I said, Bernie, the checking account has three digits in it and two of them are after the decimal point. <laughs> I said, help. And so uh, fortunately, we kind of pulled ourselves together and we got a check in on Monday, the following Monday for 10 grand. And then we went up and met the guy. And he says, oh, do you need anything else? And uh, Bernie says, oh, no, we don't need anything. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, I could use an extra 25,000. And he says, oh, yeah, OK, I'll give you that. And so it tied us over because I was, had some funding coming in the following January. But uh, 
I tell you, when you look at the bank balance and you got $9.97, that is not a happy day. It's like being a graduate student at the end of the month. <laughs> this way, yes. Yeah, but you've got other people depending on you now, so then you've got, uh, uh, it, was, it was not good. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what, what do you think? Um, well, I, I think uh, I agree with uh, both Bill and Paul. I mean, it's a diverse, um, you know, sort of situation out there, but everybody as an entrepreneur has uh, one of Bill's stories. Uh, Paul doesn't have it already, he'll have no, it someday. Already, I, do you have <laughs> yeah. I've got the part of the, the, the bank account. The bank account, uh, yeah. I don't have the $300 million one yet. <laughs> yeah, but what's going to get you between those two points? And in my mind, it is, I think it's passion and creativity. Yeah. You know, of course, you need to have a fundamental technology, right? If you're not in love with, with your technology, maybe don't get started as an entrepreneur, because yeah. it isn't the easiest thing in the world. It's really fun if that's what you really want. But if you think you're gonna make a lot of money and that's really your basic pursuit is making money, then you probably aren't going to be able to make it through all the different challenges that you're gonna face. But if you're doing it for the reason that Paul's stating, that he's just like, look, I saw this opportunity and I didn't wanna be kicking myself later that I didn't take it. And then if you could recognize that failure is not the end of the world, it's just the end of that one idea, and you know you're going to live and go on, and you know you can do other things. It's uh, you don't have to be the CEO, uh, and uh, then you know dive into it if that's what you feel like doing, and then just deal with it as it comes. And uh, and I think that you know necessity is the mother of invention when it comes to business models, when it comes to survival, when it comes to literally everything and that entrepreneurs that have the, you know, just the commitment to go through have a high propensity of succeeding eventually after a plethora of stories that would blow your mind. And if we had more time, I would blow your mind with some of the things that happened to me. But it was just like, yeah, okay, now this happened, now deal with it. And, uh, and just the recognition that the thing that scared me the most is that my wife might not have the lifestyle to which she be a, had become accustomed or had decided she was entitled to, right? But this was literally, because me, I was like, you know, I don't need much. Uh, so uh, regardless of how this goes, I'm loving every day of this, mm -hmm. and I love the challenges, and I love the learning, and, you know, so there's nothing else that I want to do besides this right now, and if it doesn't work out, yeah, we'll just see about what's next. But uh, I had somebody else that was depending on me and that was you know, the fear factor for me because I had all the defense mechanisms already built in you know, about like failure. I, was, I, I could access you know, quotes like Edison, you know, every experiment that didn't work out was actually showed us something that doesn't work and that built our understanding and made us more successful. And you know, if, you can, if you can find those things that that, uh, you know, that can continue to reassure you or hearing stories about, yeah, we remember at MedImmune many times saying, you know, we're on the brink of going out of business. Should we even keep trying? MedImmune, right? That was, you know, that serendipitously crossed my desk right about the time when I was wondering whether to go on. So, you know, maybe this is a sign from, you know, the heavens that, you know, just keep going. Doesn't matter what it is that keeps you going. But if you keep going, and if your vision is reasonably accurate, and if you're always thinking about this and loving it, you'll be inventing things in the shower, which is really like, you know, if we had more time, I'd tell you this is where HIV cure came from. I was just sitting around thinking about our technology and getting an idea as a computer programmer and going into the PhDs and saying, would this work? And they were like, yeah, it might. I'm going, yeah, let's try it. And that started the HIV program. So. If, but if that's what's going on with you, if you have that kind of love, that kind of interest, you're having that much fun at your day-to-day -day activities, you really have a good chance of succeeding. And then recognize that the CEO is a salesperson. They are constantly selling the vision, not just externally, but even internally to their own people. Sometimes I was neglecting that because I was so busy going out and gathering money that I forgot to tell everybody in the company, here's where we're going. And here's why I think we'll be successful, and here's the mission, and here's why you should be excited to be part of it. 
Now I try to balance that stuff out. But you are a salesperson, and <clears throat> if your pitches aren't successful, it's because you're not walking a mile in the shoe, shoes of the people that you're talking to and trying to understand what do they give a crap about, right? They don't necessarily want the same things out of life that you do, but that doesn't mean that you, your missions, your needs, your agendas can't overlap. And I had a meeting with some guy who looked at me and after I told him about this whole thing and I told him all the money that he could make and, and then I made the mistake of saying, and what's cool about this is we'd be making money by helping people. And he, you know what he said to me? He goes, I would love to make money by helping people, but if I could make money by dropping bombs on them, I'd be just as happy. And I was like, wow, I really respected that. I knew a lot of people were thinking that way, but I never thought I'd meet somebody who would actually articulate it. And, and so that's the thing, is like, look at the guy that you're with and say, is there some way that we can play together, right? Because that guy can invest money, and he'll make money, and I'm not going to drop a bomb on anybody, and he's not going to require me to do that. So it may be compatible. But, yeah. yeah. Can, can I add something? The, um, the, the, the fear point, too, I, or failure, failure. Um, I, I think that if you are truly in love with what you do um, and you have a vision, your perspective on the concept of failure completely changes. It's embraced. It's expected. It's, you view it as something that is, you learn more from that than you do from success. But I think in order to get to that point mentally, you absolutely have to be in love with what you do and you have to believe it yourself that there is a vision that really can change the world. Um, and then in terms of the vision, enabling it, it's people and surrounding yourself with the right people, particularly in the areas that you have no expertise, right? There are some VCs, like, you know, there's this meme going around on the internet. It's um, talking about, you know, credibility with, with, with um, you know, younger, younger folks. And there's two, there are two gentlemen across the table and they're talking to this kid and they're saying, we're looking for somebody between the ages of 22 to 26 with 30 years of experience, right? <laughs> um, I, I have certainly seen that talking to, to you know, some VCs. And, and so, I'm, just to share, like, and, and when you hear that, you, you worry about, you know, the failure thing and all this stuff. And, but what you do is you end up jiving with, with people that you know are, are the best at what they do in something you lack. Um, and, and so that... So does that... That also, though, entails giving up a certain amount of control, right? So when you first start out, it's your vision, it's you, it's your idea. You're kind of driving everything, right? And you do that for 18, 19, 20 hours a day, depending on your, your sleep needs. But then as you bring people on and you start delegating to those folks, you're giving up an element of control. So not only that plays into the fear thing, right, because there's a fear, I think, in a lot of folks of giving up control. Um, and it, it also plays into sort of the vision and the management thing because, you know, people will at times become demotivated. They will become, uh, you know, a little bit less than enthusiastic about what they're doing. And so part of your job is not only to give up the control but to sort of monitor the situation and when people need a boost to be able to step in and give them that boost. Hmm. Um, I don't think those are, for most people, uh, skills that, that are, you're born with. I, yeah. I suspect they're, except for maybe Jeff, um, I suspect there are <laughs> skills that you, you have to learn, right? Well, actually, if I could share something about that, um, I'm going through that process right now. And the conclusion I've come to is that um, you have to shift your thinking from being thinking like a founder to thinking like a manager. And um, those are two very, very different concepts. And, and I, you know, the realization I had is for this thing to be successful, you, you, you've got to almost stop thinking like a founder and start thinking like a manager in order to delegate. Okay. So
So maybe we have a little bit of time, and I want to leave a buffer for folks in the audience who have questions. But um, IO is is the thing in cancer right now, and you know, to some degree, people are less focused on the traditional cytotoxics, the radiation that that I think Jeff was mentioning. Um, those are getting downplayed, and if you listen to folks, they'll say the future is sort of CAR T cells and, and oncolytic viruses and, and gene therapy and other things that, that are a bit different than that. Um, how do you see the three of you um, sort of cancer therapy evolving in the future, and what about you know, those earlier therapies that are a bit less selective, will they still have a role? And if they will have a role, what, what is that role? I'll go ahead and give you my answer first then, since I'm here. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the way that I look at, at cancer is a little bit different than uh, maybe many, is that a lot of, particularly in the medical community, uh, doctors tend to kind of bin the patients based on you know, gross clinical manifestation of the disease. And so I, I prefer to kind of look at, at cancer as more like a thumbprint. And so it's very complicated and very personalized for each, each individual, and their particular profile is really going to have to uh, come into focus in order to, to convert cancer from a lethal disease into a chronic disease. And I think that's really the first stage for our objective as, as uh, scientists is it's uh, the idea of curing cancer well it's a wonderful idea let's just make sure that people stay alive and and because it's very hard to, to uh, completely eliminate the lineage that leads to the tumor uh, the tumor is the last manifestation of the cancer you can see it uh, there's lots of other little pieces that along the way that led to that tumor so uh, first we have to eradicate that we can see and then we have to get after the stuff that's difficult to find and difficult to see. So I look at, at immuno-oncology as, as one very important tool in the toolbox. All the other components have their place. And it really the big challenge and part of the, the looming challenge for us in, that have to do clinical studies is finding a way to be able to uh, put together these various pieces in a way that, that uh, gets solutions for individuals. And so uh, I work with uh, one cancer foundation, and the little theme there is curing cancer one patient at a time. You know, we can really only deal with one person at a time effectively. And so it's, uh, uh, that's kind of contrary to the general pharma thing of, hey, we want to get something that's going to treat millions of people, make a billion dollars, what have you. That's, that's a nice opportunity and a nice way to look at it. But the reality is that uh, if you have cancer, the only, thing, only, th only person you care about having cancer is you. And, mm -hmm. and that we have to really be aware of the role that the patient has in immuno-oncology and immunotherapy and that we're tailoring opportunities for treatment that suits that patient and brings that patient a solution. So it's very complicated. I, I think we're a long way from having any sort of definitive solutions. So you're kind of focusing more on a sort of precision medicine angle at the same time you're also the fda is heading in exactly the same direction right they're taking patient inputs into account significantly more often than they used to in clinical trials and using that as part of you know, the basis of any approval or licensing decision so i i think you know, that is spot on Jeff? Well, you know, immuno-oncology, immuno like everything that's come before it, is, uh, you know, just an, a fad. It's the id technology today, you know, like monoclonal antibodies were 10 years ago. I mean, let's be realistic about it. Technology moves forward. That's why we named the company American Gene Technologies. We said we'll stay in the gene space, but it's like we're not gene therapy, we're not viral vectors, we're not, no. I mean, it's a recognition that, you know, there's this emerging powerful trend towards the reprogramming of the human computer that will ultimately lead to powerful new solutions that are not accessible any other way. And so, um, you know, it's like, 
It's the it technology because it is the best technology. So I'm not diminishing immuno-oncology. All I'm saying is that, you know, it is the best thing we got today. And that it's now in this uh, mode where it's being broadly recognized by the, the, the entire community. You know, the researchers, the doctors, the patients, the popular press, the VCs, the uh, Wall Street, you know, whatever. It makes it a really easy environment to raise money in if you can go ahead and, you know, come up with an idea that fits the, that model, that financial community's model. And believe me, in Silicon Valley, I lived through that in computers, software, and the internet. So I played that game many, many times. So I understand what they're looking for. And this is, so this is where, all, you know, there's tons and tons of, of activity. Cancer is an incredibly complex disease because it's not one disease, it's like a, a, you know, a cornucopia of, of diseases. The complex, I really admire what Paul's doing, the idea that you could go ahead and reduce you know, the human body to a model, to a computer model. And I've heard this stuff before, and I recognize that it's becoming, it's time is coming, you know? So I love this, you know, that he's looking a little bit further down the road saying, yeah, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand, but we eventually we will, and it can go into our model, right? And we'll get better and better information, and this is gonna merge with all the other technologies. And, and I'm a technologist, I'm not a molecular biologist, I'm not a healthcare specialist, I'm not a, a biotech guy. I just understand that that's the way technology goes. If you look at viral vectors, it follows the same trend as everything else out there. The capabilities double every year and the cost halves. It's the Moore's law of computers and it's true in any technology. And you know, so if you can dream it, you can do it. And it's all a matter of timing. You know, there's only one thing that's more deadly than being too late to an idea, and that's being too early. Because you spend a lot of money your business fails, and it is humiliating to see that two years later somebody does the same thing and it takes off like a rocket. And I've been there too. <laughs> so, you know, that's the, you know, find a vision, find something you're in love with, enjoy what you're doing every day, go for it, engage people. People are absolutely core. I never worry about controlling them because I recognize that deep down I'm a lazy, lazy man and that I'm not gonna be able to do this all on my own. What I need is other people that are energized around my mission who are gonna carry it forward. And the last thing I wanna do is control them. Uh, the back of our card says, where creativity cures. I treat them the way that I wanna be treated. If I'm in love with something, you'll get a good result. Okay, I understand raising money, I've gotten good results there. David Pauza understands science, he gets me good results there. You know, I think he's sometimes surprised that, you know, I, don't, I have no interest in bossing him around. You know, there may be things that I have to make a final decision on, but it's like, no, you know, I'm just glad that I have some innate ability to recognize other smart folks. And I, I run it about 80 to 90%, and I think that's pretty good. And the ones that aren't clicking, I get rid of them and I don't judge them. I just go, it's not a fit for some reason. And it doesn't mean that they're not a great person. It's just like, you know, responsibilities on both sides to make this thing work and it's not working, so let's try something new. And, and so that's my, you know, that was one of the things that you asked, but that's how I feel about this whole thing. Yeah, and I think that's actually a very healthy, I think it gives you uh, perspective because you've seen waves of technology sort of wash over and understanding that, right, you can more, I think, neutrally judge the the benefits and the potential drawbacks of you know, technology that you're working with in the IO space. And that kind of objectivity, I think, is a significant advantage. Well, especially coming out of software, right? Software, you just need to solve a problem. And it's got to be reliable, right? And so, you know, everything that I do is like, keep it simple, stupid, right? You know, from that old, um, Ray Kroc quote, right? <clears throat> that don't take on unnecessary c complexities. Figure out what works, what's, you know, what is just beyond our capabilities as opposed to way out in front of our capabilities right now and just get it done and then go on to the next thing. 
and try to incrementally build this thing. And here's another wonderful thing about technology. There'll be some stumbling block that you're going to hit, and we saw this all the time in computers, right, where you're like, ah, we can't solve this problem, and we keep trying and trying and trying internally. Well, the nature of high tech, which is really different than traditional drug development, by the way, which I would say is not very high tech. I call it the, the Forrest Gump model of drug discovery. It's, you know, drug discovery is a box of chocolates. You have to bite into each one to see what you got. That's an expensive process, right? But it's not that way anymore. We can deterministically, I mean, Paul will back me up on this, we can select things that are likely to work and we can engineer those solutions by pulling pieces together. So that piece that you're missing may not come from your company, it may come from that company over there. They can contribute something really good. And in Silicon Valley, what do we used to call it? Cooperation. We were constantly engaging our competitors by in-licensing their stuff or trading things or or hiring their, their people and stealing it, right? And that's the nature of this industry now. I just got somebody poached from my organization, you know, because we got on some, the radar in screen, the age right? of the Defend Trade Secrets Act, I, of course, cannot endorse that strategy, but it does happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, let's put it this way, that there's an there's a ether of expertise out there that we all draw from, and don't start thinking that you're unique. Right? The bottom line is, is again, it's your mission and your vision that will gel your organization. And, you know, and when somebody gets poached, because we looked at it this way, it's great. They self-selected for somebody that hadn't really drunk the Kool-Aid in the organization and probably wasn't as deeply engaged as they could have been. And there's a lot of other people out there that would love their job in a place where the CEO has no interest in controlling them. His only interest is getting the best out of them and finding as much commercial value and enabling them so that they can enable this technology and they can bring it out to the, to the, to the population. Yeah, and if they get pushed, you're doing something right. I mean, it, environment makes a difference there, right? I was out in San Francisco, I was talking to uh, a CEO and he was saying, you know, well, you know, our scientists, why do we need patents, was the question he was asking me. And I, I said to him, you're, this is a joke, right? We're not really having this conversation. <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, I don't see why we need patents because we, we pay our employees phenomenally well and this and that. And I said, okay, so, um, like, what do you pay them? He said, well, we pay our scientists $140,000 a year, which is a nice amount of money. So said, okay, but they're in San Francisco. So if rent is $6,000 a month, that's $72,000 a year, which automatically cuts off half of that, right? The government takes another 40%, maybe a bit more, because taxes are higher in California. And you know, by my back of the envelope calculation, um, you know, your well-paid employee has $16,000 left to cover uh, clothing, food, entertainment, transportation, you know, so, like, if somebody comes along and offers them 160000 that $20,000 at the margin is going to make a huge difference, and they probably will jump, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think in other situations, it's still kind of um, an indication that you're training people the right way and that you're giving them the right skill set. They're giving themselves the right skill set. And, and it's a, you're creating a really good work environment where people are going to want to come in and be part of your team. Yeah, well, it, you know, there's a, it, I don't really look at that event as being a really negative thing, and I sort of thought a little bit about that as well as I just thought, well, you know, it means that the AGT logo is starting to get a little bit of a halo effect because we're out there messaging it well enough and there's enough actual tangible successes where somebody can put this on their resume and it actually helps them get another job. But also, um, you know, I, the, um, it's just the, the real world. This is another thing as an entrepreneur. It's like, just you're gonna have to deal with the real world. This whole thing about poaching employees, and here's another way to fix that problem, is that the CEOs of the three biggest companies in Silicon Valley can get together for lunch and agree not to hire from each other. Uh, only until... Until they get caught, right. But see, this is the real world, you get it? This is the real world. Now, was the fine bigger than what they made off of that deal? Who knows, you know? So, you know, that's the thing is entrepreneurship also involves just being, 
having being in touch with reality when you're sitting across the table from somebody that you're trying to engage be realistic about what's important to them when you're living in the world and dealing with employees be realistic you just did a really good back of the envelope model about why you know basically 140,000 in silicon valley is slave labor <laughs> practically i mean you got to get in everybody else's shoes and you know live in the real world and deal with the fact that you know, sometimes it's corrupt, sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's misunderstanding, sometimes it's intentional malfeasance, and deal with it yeah. one challenge at a time. And, and for any of you who are thinking just of engaging in, you know, some antitrust... Uh, or, you know, I'm not endorsing that, by the way. Right. I'm he's just not, saying not, that... He's no, not I'm just saying, I'm, I'm being so. ironic about this whole thing, is that, look, that's a big example of a big bad, right? And they paid for it, and, you know, whatever, it got caught. But, you know, I lived through the days where Microsoft stole everything they could put their hands on, and they never paid for it. They never, ever, they almost, they were on the brink of a breakup, right? But enough lobbying and better lawyers than the Justice Department has, and, you know, and Wilson Sonsini has some great lawyers, by the way, if you're, the you. you know, Jay's you. after Thank you. you. Uh, just, yeah. Jeff's, <laughs> Jeff's check is in the mail, by the way. <laughs> and each time you Thanks. say we, that, we'll increase the money's the going straight of, into developing more gene and cell therapies. It's the, well deployed. The number of decimal points, you know, numbers to the the left of the decimal point will increase. <laughs> so you from one. Thanks. Um, you know, the thing is, just as a sidelight on that, right? I've been at, at the FTC, and those kinds of cases are nightmares. You get into something like that, you get a consent degree. You've got somebody from the government who is overseeing your company for the next five years. You've got to put in place all these training issues. Every employee has to be trained. It is, uh, it is, it's defined in comparison to the other things that go with it is trivial. But, um, but, but that's such a lawyer way of looking at this. And by the way, <laughs> like I said, I'm not, in, I don't say that anybody here should do something unethical. No, I think exactly the opposite. And I'll tell you that our company is absolutely ethical, absolutely legal. We're constantly being concerned about being fair and honest and all those things. I'm just saying that this thing's going to happen to you. When you're an entrepreneur, somebody's going to do that to you, all right? And maybe they're going to get their just desserts down the road, but it's still going to be a crisis for you to get over. So. Get used to it. Yeah, and especially if that employee is a key employee, because it's not easy to you know, just pull up the Rolodex and replace that person. Well, they didn't do anything illegal or immoral by hiring this guy. That was different. And by the way, he's got a really good contract that says that if he spills any of our confidential material, he's in big trouble. And, you know, and I think he would really be. Yeah. So uh, here's another shout out to the lawyers, right? When you're forming your company, Get a basic package of things that structure deals between you and other people, no matter who those people are, even if they're your employees. Be on a contract yourself, right? I have the same employee contract that everybody else in the company has. It's important in terms of the due diligence on your company and people investing money. They feel like, oh, this is professionally Jeff, run. Jeff, yeah. I'm sorry. These are yeah. all good points, but we're kind of, the clock is running down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Paul, um, you know, and, and you should take that to heart, by the way. Everything Jeff is saying is absolutely true. And if you're going to start a company, you want those consulting agreements, you want those employee agreements. They have to be ironclad in a number of areas. If you don't have those, they will blow your company up. So um, it sounds like a pitch to try to get you to use lawyers in a way maybe it is. But really, it's a pitch to save your company and a lot of heartache down the road. So Paul, you have uh, kind of the last word on whatever you want to take. Okay, that's open. Um, so <laughs> may, maybe I'll go back to the, the question you asked about these different therapeutic modalities and um, you know, perhaps how we think about it. Um, and, and to be consistent with the precision medicine approach. So, so, so cancer in some regards is unique for every patient living with cancer, right? Um, when I step back and I take a look at all these different therapeutic modalities, and yeah, like, you know, cell-based therapies right now are super hot, you know, looking at what happened with Kite and Juno. Um, but I, I think it's great in the sense that 
we will master another modality because every patient is likely going to need, you know, a minimum of a combination. And um, that combination is going to come from different therapeutic modalities. Uh, I'll tell you, monoclonal antibodies aren't going anywhere. Our body has evolved over millions of years to develop that three-dimensional protein structure for a reason. So, so monoclonals, um, cell-based, you know, therapies, um, vaccine platforms, um, small molecules, they're all going to remain in the bag of, you know, in our armamentarium against cancer. So, so I view the, the therapeutic modalities that are hot today as great because I look at, that, look at that 10 years from now as that's another kind of, we've mastered um, you know, another therapeutic modality to help a single patient because that actually really matters. Um, in terms of going back to the question about these cytotoxic drugs or chemotherapeutic agents, I, I think that as we deepen our understanding of, of the biology behind cancer, its behavior, its function in a, pa in, in a person, um, we will further understand when to apply them. And I think it's going to be a really hot space in the world of epigenetics, right? We already know that there are chemotherapeutic agents like cyclophosphamide that can convert tumors from cold to hot, right? So it's... Um, so even chemo drugs I don't view as being put to the wayside. I think our problem uh, is going to be, or the challenge is, which patient, you know, for a given patient, what are they most likely to benefit from? What combination? Thank you. And that's a very practical perspective from a very experienced oncologist. So thank you. Okay, so before we go to uh, questions, um, just like to thank our panelists uh, for a very interesting discussion, for sharing their experiences uh, and their time, and thank all of you for attending. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>
you know, w what is the, the regimen that they're going to most likely benefit from? Thank you. I, I would just add to that. Uh, I think that uh, I'm an advocate of what we call a live tissue pathology. And so the storing of the tumor at the moment of surgery is, is really a great opportunity and often in today's surgical environment it's an opportunity lost. I mean, the, the tissue gets sent to the pathology lab, it gets uh, frozen, sliced, diced, stained, what have you, but it's, a, it's alive at the time that it's taken out and it's a, a wealth of information there that's waiting to be tapped and there are organizations and companies that are trying to exploit that and I think that's a, at least as an intermediary step, it's a, a, an important thing that goes along with uh, bio, biomarkers and genomics and epigenetic kind of things. Yep, definitely. Thank you. Uh, and then I have one more question. If, I don't know yeah, if anyone. Yeah. Um, so this is more of a, like a general CEO question. Um, how do you guys communicate with your employees specifically, kind of your passion and your vision, and how do you kind of try to share that and foster it in your employees? I guess. But I think Jeff I, touched on that originally. So. Yeah. I, to me, I think the. What I've always tried to do is just uh, uh, be available to the staff and when it's, when we have major decisions, we just meet and uh, I noticed as the company grew that we were having more uh, kind of isolated groups. So uh, I just started a pizza Thursday. So you know, every Thursday we're all in the room together for lunch and it's just one way to get people sitting around and talking and I think that you do uh, uh, organizational events where you kind of try to build a little bit of community and I've really tried to make uh, immunomic therapeutics kind of a fa family-friendly company, and uh, I think people appreciate that, and and uh, they get to see the company presentations, and we do a lot of newsletters, and so uh, they should be reasonably well informed. If they want to know, walk in my office and ask. Yeah. Great, thank you. If you got uh, anything, to yeah, add? I just uh, I like the pizza Thursday idea. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna steal that one. Like the um, yeah, first of all, know what your message is. I mean you know, if you got it, and then just recognize that you have to be constantly communicating it, and you're gonna have to do it in many different forms, and everybody takes hearing it way more than once to get it. I mean, you guys will walk out of here, and you'll hear, you'll remember some stuff you heard here, and other things, you're gonna have to hear it two more times. And, and so, it's a constant thing, and you also try to generate other key people in the organization who really buy into it, and you try to put them, you know, in a position where uh, they will help to message this, and but the uh, importance of it, I could definitely say, you know, that uh, what, what Bill is alluding to and what your question, you know, uh, brings up is that that communication turned out to be way more important than I realized, uh, and it's something that I'm still, uh, you know, learning and getting better at, but, you know, I also have the same open door policy and I also try to iterate at every company party that we have that and that when people find something in the company mysterious, you can ask anybody, anybody in the company, including me. So um, in addition to build on um, Bill and Jeff's from, you know, at our early stage, I, I think number one is being transparent and genuine. That's got to be there. If it's not there, nobody's going to care what you have to say. Um, so you know, I you know, we are a very direct, transparent group. Um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I've made my career on dumb questions that were side you know put on the side. Um, letting them know you you actually genuinely care, like reaching out, checking in on how they're doing, how's 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 their family doing, chat with them about the kids. Um, ask if there's anything you can do. Um, and then y you have to be convincing that what you guys are, what people, what you're pursuing as a team, not as an individual. I never use the word I in our company. It's always we. Um, convincing the team that, that what you are pursuing together is fundamentally so important that whether it fails or not, is, irres is irrelevant. It's, it's knowing what the outcome is going to be. Um, so that, you know, that's been my experience, limited experience. Thank you so much. My question is your interaction with the medical community as uh, a potential patient. I think it's, I want to know that my medical staff who I could be relying on is familiar with what you're doing. 
Um, how, do, how do you interact with the medical community to get across what you're doing, and are they receptive? Very difficult. Uh, I, I think uh, I was telling some people before that the event that only 3% of patients participate in clinical trials. And so uh, the clinical clinicians that we work with for our G GBM studies are great guys. But you know, at heart, we, what we've ended up having to do is at the neuroscience meetings is host dinners with neurosurgeons to get them engaged in and understanding what the clinical study is all about and why they should be sending patients. It's, it's just a, a big obstacle and it's a huge challenge for the medical community, FDA, our industry to make that work. Paul's got a flight. He's yeah. going to have to yeah. run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to run. Okay. I boarded. He's got a much longer commute than down to <laughs> Gaithersburg. Yeah, he's <laughs> heading back to San Francisco. Good yes. to meet you. Yes, good to, yeah. good to meet Charles, you, too. Thank you. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. You don't know, but I have an, I have an idea around that. Uh, okay, yeah, here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to watch yes. this. This is the nitty gritty of being Actual a CEO. You're, you're yeah. seeing yeah. it happen. Yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for having us. <laughs>when you're using CAR-T therapy, and how you well, can... Well, we're not using CAR-T, but yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, how you can reach the population, which is really needed that gene therapy, if one day your um, therapy get FDA approved. Okay, so you're, you're absolutely right that new uh, gene and cell therapies are probably gonna be too expensive for people in sub-Saharan, uh, you know, African countries to buy on first blush. But once again, I go back to my model of technology. You'd be surprised how many of those people are ca carrying cell phones. Do you think back in the days of uh, mainframe computers that anybody in Chad thought they'd have com computational power? Forget it, it's gonna happen, all right? So yes, I apologize that it's gonna be very expensive to bring out these first things, and they're not gonna be cheap but they're gonna be cheaper than treating people in the United States and Europe, and that that's gonna drive further innovation, and I am absolutely committed to getting it down to the lowest income person. It's why I probably won't last as CEO of this company once we go public, because people are, you know, my interest was in the patient. It always was. It wasn't in the individual patient. That's a weird thing, because I think Bill said something that was really compassionate, and I felt bad that I didn't feel necessarily the same way, but I don't even view myself the same way. I'm no more important than that sub-Saharan African child you know, that's born with HIV inherently, and I'm looking for big solutions and trends that are gonna bring this to everyone. So I'm on your side, and we are already working on a vaccine program that would just be a shot in the arm, and we're already working on bringing that $250,000, by the way, it's way cheaper than CAR-T, thing down to you know a level where everybody can afford to get it by changing it from an, ex an ex vivo cell therapy to a shot in the arm, and that is possible. It's not just possible. If we don't do it, somebody else will. We're going to be looking to obsolete ourselves before somebody else comes up with that great idea and does it. So, yeah, I get where you're coming from, and it, you're not out totally in the cold. You're just not the first, you know, what we call early adopters. <laughs> first Macintosh that came out was 2000 bucks and didn't do anything. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hello, my name is Luba Vestrovska, and I'm chief, uh, president and chief science officer of the small early stage company, Stem Saitera. Uh, my question is actually a continuation and I follow up on your question. The, the um, tumor, and I do appreciate your understanding that the cancer is really complex each, and the complexity is increased by the actually fact that the tumor is heterogeneous and that um, 
the environment changes, the tumor involving, the cancer develops, and uh, my company can propose and can offer really unique solution for the problem. Mm -hmm. So my question is, coming back to the question, uh, the, how do you manage the, what was your intellectual property strategy, and uh, how do you manage the regulatory issues? How do you deal with the government? How do you, what is the structure of your relationships in this field? Before Thank you, you so much. This, that question is something that people spend you know, days, weeks, months, years on. I mean, so Jeff, Well, I'll simplify it. To, he thinks I talk too much and everybody else says that about me too, so he's not unique. Um, the, uh, how do I get, deal with all that stuff? Experts. It just goes back to the ability to recognize somebody that has expertise in a domain, even if you don't understand that domain totally, getting some, you know, guesstimates at least of what it's going to take to do it, figuring out how to get the resources to make that happen. So, you know, how do I deal with intellectual property? It's like $100,000 a month is how I deal with it. It ain't cheap. But, you know, we have our Port, last valuation on our portfolio of IP was a billion dollars. All right, so you know you can spend hundred thousand dollars a month for a long time, and a billion dollars is still a nice return. So if you in, if you do you know you recognize the areas that are important, and you're going to have to run a balancing act as an entrepreneur about how you're going to you're not going to be able to get everything, so you're going to have to find a mix of these things that's efficient economically and that yield you know a valuable results and you're going to have to engage lawyers and, and all those types and regulatory people and all that stuff. And I see here really many people who are there. I know this ecosystem very well and I know that uh, there are so many small companies, students who want to start their own company. So what would be your advice to the small business that starts and doesn't have those resources available, let's say, to you? So, and we live in the real world. world. Yeah. You, you, you actually pointed on the real, really good issues when people are rehired by the companies and secrets are stolen and all this stuff. So what yeah. would be your advice? So, okay, so my advice would be, don't take a simple answer from me on this podium right now. It's, it, it's more, you know, if I heard more about your individual situation, I could probably give you some good advice. So maybe find a mentor right, who's been through the ringer before, and, you know, go ahead and, and borrow their brain on things that are complex, but that they've dealt with before, and that they can help you so to solve specific questions. Because there's a lot of people out there that are happy to mentor, and I'm mentoring a bunch of people. I, I love this stuff. I love to talk, as Charles will uh, uh, attest to. And it's an opportunity for people like me to share stuff that we are excited by with people that excite us because they have passion for what they're doing, you know, and they have problems that we faced and whatever. From just hearing the teeniest bit about what you've got, I'd say find a good partner. Because if you have a good technology and if you can protect it just enough, even as just a trade secret, that you can talk about it and you can find somebody that has some belief in it that has a little bit more resources, right? Because I always envision my company as encompassing a lot of companies, not necessarily yours, I just don't know enough about it, but a lot of companies that have ideas for apps on our platform and that we would provide not just a platform in terms of you know, some technology that they could build with, but a platform in which they could hope to commercialize and perpetuate their great idea, right? Because you, know, the, you need all the things that you're asking about, but we got them, right? If we're not patenting our stuff, we can patent your stuff. If we're not, you know, doing a contract for a collaborator for us, we can do one for you. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of platform technologies that we had to develop in, in AGT that would be useful in, in areas like this as well. Once we get excess resources, we're going to be looking for people with great ideas and, and figuring out a, a model for trying it out. But this can't be the, you know, the first time somebody had that idea. I'm guessing that there's a bunch of companies out there that could utilize your technology. So look out there and say, okay, who would get it? Who would drink the Kool-Aid in a meeting, right? And when you figure that out, go out and be friendly, you know?
Okay, thank yeah. you for your yeah. advice. And I just, <coughs> take, my take point, home message is how life system are different from just simplification by applications or platforms or, and they are so different. And oh. human, com, humans are not computers. So that's my no, take home are. message. And thank I, you so yeah, much. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding like I'm oversimplifying it because I understand how complex biology is. But still, there are some, you know, sort of, there's some parallels. And, and think about it, that the computer couldn't happen without the transistor, without the capacitor, without all these components in my mind, right? It's like, that's why I think that this whole scientific community is so rich, and I never hear something that I don't think has value. It's just a matter of when it has value, and what will it open up? And I also recognize that, you know, my stuff is so immature compared to, where this industry will be in 10 years in terms of just understanding the bi biology. And this is why Paul's company just fascinated me. I just find that incredibly ambitious to take on the complexity that you're alluding to and to try to model it. Yeah, but business is, is simpler than biology. <laughs> That's why I have to simplify it as so a CEO. I wanna, uh, I wanna leave some time. Uh, you're gonna stick around and um, have some more conversations about this, I hope. We have um, right around the other side of this magic wall here, we've got uh, some food catered by Kava and, um, and some refreshments for everybody. So there's plenty to talk about for sure. Lots of good questions. So um, again, this has been a fantastic panel. Charlie, Bill, Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. I wanna... Uh, <laughs> So smoothly. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. And it was a collaborative effort. I'd like to introduce uh, Martha from uh, PickMC just to, to close things down and, and wrap everything up. And Chris does such a good job in the opening. There's really nothing left for me to say except that we welcome you here. Uh, every College is a community college. You're the community. It's your college. We welcome you here. We love businesses. We work very hard to train your workforce. And hopefully one day that you will love us back and want to locate on our campus. So we will have room for you. And with that, dinner is served.